So we're just letting everybody jump on board. Uh, welcome back to uh, Fertility Factor Fiction. Uh, happy to have you all here. Uh, for those of you that haven't seen the show before, we try and cover one topic and then we go over uh, questions and answers and I try and answer all of your questions live. And usually we're pretty good. We can get through almost everybody's questions, although we are growing quite rapidly. Uh, last week was our biggest show we've ever had, so thank you to everybody that watched. And uh, hopefully with it getting bigger and bigger, we'll just be able to answer more questions as we go. I guess at some point we might need to um, have it even bigger, uh, a bigger or longer show, or maybe we're getting more people. I don't know. <laughs> more, days. more days. More days. Oh, okay. I, we may need to do it uh, twice a week instead of just once a week. So uh, welcome back, and uh, we hope all of you are doing well and you are staying safe. To all of our patients and friends and family around the Toronto area and Peel region, um, I'm sorry you guys went back into lockdown. We are still open in Windsor, so uh, thankfully things are continuing along here. Um, but if you are in one of those other areas, please be safe, uh, observe all of the safety precautions and make sure that uh, you're doing everything you can to minimize the transmission of this horrible, horrible plague that is affecting all of us. So, um, uh, you know, with that, uh, I think we'll get started fairly shortly. So grab a coffee or a tea or uh, something healthy like water um, with some uh, fruit or uh, vegetable in it and, uh, and join us. Um, I think you'll find tonight's talk Topic quite interesting. There's a lot of debate as to whether fresh embryo transfer is more successful or frozen embryo transfer is more successful just purely in terms of getting pregnant. But the other part of the equation is what happens to the actual pregnancy. Is one version safer than the other? And so this is a brand new study as yet unpublished but available through Reproductive Biomedicine Online as an advanced article. It will be coming out soon. And uh, so I had a read of this just recently and thought this would be a great topic to share with you guys. We've discussed fresh versus frozen before. Um, for those of you that haven't seen that, you can find it on our YouTube channel, www.youtube.com forward slash Dr. Victory, DR Victory. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. It has all of our YouTube videos there and we keep building it. And in fact, now we're starting to do some in Persian as well. And I think we're gonna have that on the same YouTube channel. And so uh, make sure you're on there and have a look around. But we've done the topic of fresh versus frozen before. It was one of our most popular videos. And we really want to bring this one to your attention as well because it adds to the mix. Uh, capsule summary of what I've said before. In most cases, especially if your estrogen is high, frozen is better than fresh. But for patients that are doing um, a, a single embryo or they have very uh, low numbers of embryos, a fresh embryo transfer may actually be an entirely reasonable thing. Um, our place is busy and uh, we are actually uh, getting phone call, which is why I heard the bell ringing in the background at uh, 8.03 at night. So I guess it never ends around here. People are always um, wanting to do stuff with us. So, uh, okay, so I'm gonna start on the topic. So this topic's quite interesting. The authors went and put together all the studies that they could to determine uh, whether a fresh embryo transfer or a frozen embryo transfer led to different risks once you were pregnant. So this isn't about whether or not you're gonna get pregnant. Like I said, we've already dealt with that before in a previous uh, FFOF uh, episode, but it was actually about what happens once you're pregnant. So things they were looking at were your birth weight as an infant, whether there were pregnancy-related complications like preeclampsia or abruption. Um, they looked at whether you delivered prematurely or not. So all of these are really critical things. Now, as with all meta-analyses, which is what these authors conducted, there's always what we like to call garbage in, garbage out. So if you put in a bunch of bad studies, the information you get and the results you get are really not very valuable or useful. Whereas if you put in really strict criteria and you only select really good studies, the information that you're getting is a lot more valuable. So at the end of the day, what they did was they started with over 2,000 articles, but when they whittled it down to the essential ones that they were gonna use, it was only 20 articles that met their criteria for what would be considered good reporting, good data, good evidence uh, that they could use for the actual um, data analysis. So from those 20 studies, they looked at a variety of different outcomes. So the very first one they looked for 
was what your risk of delivering prematurely was. So keep in mind, premature is any time before 37 weeks, but that can be as early as sort of 23, 24, and as late as 36 and a half weeks. So they don't specify whether it was very early or just slightly early, but either way, it, it's earlier. And certainly after you've gone through all of the trauma and the grief and the hardship and the anxiety of going through a fertility journey, the most important thing for every patient is to have a smooth sailing pregnancy where there are no complications. Um, you're not by definition higher risk when you're an IVF pregnancy or any fertility pregnancy, but we definitely treat you uh, a little bit differently, or at least I treat my patients a little bit differently than I do my patients who don't have fertility issues because we want to watch them very, very carefully uh, just to make sure that there are no glitches. So, you know, frequently a little more observation, some more ultrasounds if necessary, a little more attention to their blood pressure, their growth patterns, and so on. So the first thing these guys looked at was preterm birth, and what they were checking was for uh, blastocyst transfers, fresh versus frozen. So this isn't in relation to day three embryos or day four embryos. Um, these are purely for blastocyst transfers. And what they said was that if you had a frozen embryo transfer versus a fresh embryo transfer, you had about an 11% decrease in the rate of preterm labor. Now, what does that translate into in actual numbers? Well, um, preterm birth affects between 15 to 20 percent of pregnancies. So if you reduce it by 11 percent, it's actually only going to be about a 2 percent difference in the actual rate. But if you're in that 2 percent and your baby is coming early, you definitely want to have your baby later, not earlier. So that's actually a substantial number. I know in actual total numbers, it doesn't sound like a lot. But it's still a meaningful number because that's still substantial and anything we can do to reduce complications, like I said, is really important for us and we want to do that for you. So I think that that's a very valid point. Was it significant? Yes, it was quite significant. So uh, very good data based on thousands and thousands of uh, events in this um, group So uh, and patients in this group. So very, very important. They were comparing 42,000 patients in the frozen embryo group versus 27,000 in the fresh group um, and the difference was there was only 180 uh, um, uh, events sorry uh, or an average of around 100 and so in the uh, cryopreserved group but it was a higher uh, percentage in the fresh group so if you're trying to avoid preterm labor you previously delivered preterm um, you want to consider doing a frozen embryo transfer the next thing they looked at was low birth weight. So low birth weight can come from a variety of different things, frequently high blood pressure, some vascular abnormalities, abnormalities in the placenta. And so they wanted to look at low birth weight as well. Now, why does it matter? If your baby's small when it's born, you know, it's easier to deliver, people think, and not as much trauma, maybe you don't need a C-section and so on. All of those are potentially true, except that we know that babies that are very small have a higher risk of health complications later in life, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, um, probably even things like cancer. So we wanna make sure your babies are not small when they are born because that actually has very long-term health complications and risks for your child, not when they're a child, but rather when they grow up into adults. And so avoiding a low birth weight baby is a critical issue for every OBGYN out there, let alone the fertility specialist. So very similar findings uh, compared to the um, preterm babies, they showed that there was about an 18% reduction in low birth weight babies when they had a frozen embryo transfer versus a fresh embryo transfer. So again, very highly significant, important numbers. It favors doing a frozen embryo transfer versus fresh. So can you reduce preterm birth? Check. Can you reduce low birth weight check. The next one they looked at was uh, small for gestational age, which is kind of a subcategory of the low birth weight. 
and of course the same thing but even more significant. Um, this is looked at from the percentile standpoint rather than just a cutoff of weight. And when they looked at it from that percentile standpoint, they're showing a 41% reduction in the babies that have small for gestational age status. So that obviously is very, very critical as well. Um, again, we're avoiding these babies being smaller and that's a, a really important and critical thing for you guys. So then they looked at large for gestational age. You also don't want babies that are huge because we want to protect your vagina for sure. And we want to make sure that the babies aren't at risk for diabetes. So interestingly here, while we avoid having low birth weight babies and small for gestational age babies by doing a frozen embryo transfer, we do actually slightly increase the risk or significantly increase the risk of babies being born large for gestational age. How much? Um, a lot. It's a 68% increase in the chance that the baby is large. Which one's more risky? We don't know the long-term answer for that, although I think most people would favor having a bigger baby than a smaller baby just because the long-term consequences are more significant as far as we know. But ideally we would find a balance. So this is an important finding and it needs to be factored in. And then one of the other things they looked at was placental abruption. So for those of you that don't know what that is, if this is your uterus and this is your placenta, they should be stuck together, tightly opposed to one another. Sometimes, depending on what the risk factor is, it can be trauma, high blood pressure, smoking, cocaine use, a variety of different things, um, sometimes just bad luck. The placenta can kind of lift away from the wall of the uterus. So if your placenta starts to lift away, all those blood vessels now can start to bleed, and that can be very risky. It frequently causes pain, heavy bleeding, and the baby decompensates compensates and doesn't like it and you can often end up needing to deliver the baby early. So interestingly, the patients that had fresh embryo transfers had a 42% higher rate of placental abruption than the ones that did frozen embryo transfers. Now I gotta say, this is not something that happens very often. The total number of events from 31,000 patients was only 70 in the frozen group and 82 in the fresh group from 11,000 in that population. So, I mean, obviously a much higher rate of, of, a, of occurrence, but at the same time, overall, a relatively small number of people suffering from this. So take it you know, with a grain of salt, but remember that it is a risk factor. For those of you who have high blood pressure or God forbid are smoking, um, don't smoke if you're trying to get pregnant, it doesn't work. Um, this is something to consider and to factor in. And then the last thing they looked at was cesarean section. And so they were looking at whether your C-section risk was higher or lower when you had a fresh or a frozen transfer. And actually you have a higher chance of requiring a cesarean section if you had a frozen embryo transfer than if you had a fresh. And that definitely goes along with the fact that those babies do tend to be a bit bigger. So that makes sense. I mean, a larger baby is not gonna fit through an average size pelvis. And certainly with a 68% increase in the number of babies that are larger, the risk is there that you know, you're, you're gonna end up needing more room um, because the pelvis won't accommodate those larger babies and so it may necessitate a C-section. So overall on balance, which pregnancy is safer? Well, I mean, it's gotta be individualized, but certainly reducing low birth weight, reducing small for gestational age, reducing preterm birth, which is huge, um, and then decreasing the risk of abruption, all of those are very significant factors and they need to be included in your calculus to determine which way you want to go. I think, again, overall, when you put all of this into the equation of fresh versus frozen, if you have many eggs, many embryos, and your estrogen levels are high, it does not make sense to do a fresh embryo transfer. Um, in particular, for those of you that have endometriosis, it makes no sense to do a fresh embryo transfer. But if your egg yield is much lower, if the number of embryos you have and are dealing with are much lower, um, if you are uh, you know, not doing pre-implantation genetic testing because um, you either have too few embryos, you can't afford it, or you just don't need it because you're younger, but your ovaries are a bit weaker, 
so you haven't made as many embryos, or maybe you're just doing it for religious ethical reasons, then there's nothing wrong with doing a fresh embryo transfer. On balance, there are some risks and benefits, but again, keep in mind the majority of these patients going through this are not patients with just one or two embryos. These are all comers, and most of them would have several embryos, several eggs, so there are safety differences, most likely related to the concentrations of estrogen through all of these studies, and none of them have controlled for that. So again, garbage in, garbage out. You gotta remember that they're not standardizing these results against average estrogen levels from the patients that they're looking at. So is it a factor of fiction that a fresh embryo transfer is safer than a frozen embryo transfer, it's a fiction. Overall balance, a frozen embryo transfer is probably safer than a fresh embryo transfer. But again, you gotta individualize your care. You gotta make sure that you're looking at what's important for you and your family and your health and well-being, and make your decision based on the best available information for you. So as always, like, comment, and subscribe uh, on the YouTube channel. Um, we're starting to really grow. We've got some videos there with 14, 15,000 views. Um, and so we really want to bring that to your attention. Make sure you uh, make use of that. That is what it's there for. Um, we're hoping to kind of start a uh, fertility university soon where we're going to teach some classes, most likely on a Facebook platform that's coming out. And uh, we'll keep doing these videos for you to, um, to bring attention to everyone. Uh, who's going through this journey and, and needs help and needs information. Uh, one thing I definitely want to bring everyone's attention to is very soon we're going to be working on a fertility math um, a video where we're going to go through sort of your age and your risk factors and so on and help you calculate what your chances are. I just uh, posted today and hopefully some of you saw that. Uh, that many patients are simply not hearing what their doctor is saying or maybe not listening to what their doctor is saying or maybe the doctors are simply not communicating it effectively enough in a population of patients in Israel that they studied, the patients were literally told that their chances were less than 5% that they would have a live birth from their next IVF cycle. And when they were asked what they thought their chances were, they said 49% instead of less than five. So literally 10 times higher. So it's really critical that you guys understand how to do the math to figure out what your success rates are gonna be. Because unless you understand how we are getting to the numbers, you you may walk away thinking 50% when in reality it's only five. And I know when I talk to my patients, I always tell them, and those of you who've been with me know, that I'll say, imagine you're at the casino and they're telling you to, you know, put down 10 or 15 or 20 or whatever thousand dollars it is, and your chance of winning is X percent. So let's say it's 10%. So you need to know, would you put down the 20,000 for a 10% chance? It makes it very real and very sort of tangible for a lot of patients because too many times you go to the fertility specialist and instead what they tell you is, well, you've got a chance, your best chance is to do IVF. Let's try that and see where where we go. What they're not telling you is that chance is 5% or 10% and in your mind you're so invested in the process it's very unfair to those patients because realistically those physicians are taking advantage of you and not explaining it to you and telling you hey listen yes you have a chance but that chance is 5% or it's 10% and if you're walking away from that experience thinking well I have a 50% chance we have not done our job properly in explaining it to you. So make sure you know what your numbers are, make sure you know what the reality of your chances are, and we're gonna do that calculus with you. So with that, um, always like the likes, so throw up lots of likes, guys, if those are uh, good bits of information.